Traders Point, how are we doing? Hey, it's good to be with you. You look great. Um, and before we jump into the message today, I do, I want to take a moment uh, to pray for our lead pastor. Uh, some of you guys know this, but he is on a trip right now. He's over in the Holy Land, walking through Israel, walking the very places that Jesus walked, seeing what Jesus saw. And uh, I just want to take a moment to lift him up in prayer. And just to give you guys a little bit of kind of how I approach the way I serve here, um, I come in and I try to hold up his arms the best that I can. Some of you know that language. It comes from this account in the Old Testament in the book of Exodus where the Israelites are fighting and as long as Moses' arms are lifted up, they're winning. But the moment his arms go down, they start to lose. So Aaron and Hur, the, these two people, they see this and they sit him down and then one on each arm, on, they just hold up his arms for the remaining parts of the battle and they win victoriously. So what I try to do in my ministry here is just to hold up his arms so that he can continue to serve and to lead the way that he does. So if you don't mind, would you, uh, yeah. Just symbolically kind of hold your arms out like this if you're willing, and, and we're just gonna hold him up in this moment and pray for him as he's away. Uh, Father, we come before you today, and we just pray for Pastor Aaron. Uh, God, he, as he walks through Israel, as he sees the Sea of Galilee, as, as he sees what you saw, God, I just pray that your spirit would awaken him. God, that you would give him just courage and endurance and a new perspective and, and more strength as he comes back to lead here. God, protect him and hold him and can you continue to shape him. God, we love you so much and we trust you in this prayer. It is in your perfect and holy name we pray. Amen, amen, thanks guys. But today we are continuing in our series, A Rebel's Guide to Joy, A Rebel's Guide to Joy, which we've been studying just this short letter, uh, Philippians. So it's written from this guy named Paul to this church in Philippi. And uh, what we've been doing is just seeing, you know, how Paul, this guy, is, is able to talk the way that he talks, how he's able to have joy in the midst of all of these different circumstances. And today is going to be no different. We're going to jump into, here, here's the big topic of today. We've looked at a bunch of different stuff of like, how can we have joy when temptation comes, right? How can we have joy when our pride continues to try to steal from us? And today it's Rebel's Guide to Joy. How do we find joy when facing conflict? Are those two things, is that possible to have joy in the midst of conflict? And the unique thing about today's message that I just wanna be upfront about, today's message is a collaboration. Uh, me and the other campus pastors got together over the past few weeks and, and we wrote this message together. So I say that, that if you love this message, give them the credit, right? They deserve it. At the same time, if you don't love this message, <laughs> blame them. And that's, that's, that's leadership, right? Um, no. But here's what we're gonna look at, conflict. A lot of times when we talk about conflict, how we deal with it, we'll set it up in two extremes. Maybe you've heard of like fight or flight. The way we talk about it around here is either silence or violence. Violence not in the sense necessarily of physically, you know, assaulting someone, but here's the idea. When conflict comes, if I'm more on the side of violence, I, I step into the conflict. I want the smoke. Like, I'm, I'm here, I wanna handle things right now. But maybe if you're on the other side and you, you kind of more gravitate towards silence, you, you withdraw from conflict. You, you take a, a step back. And I think a lot of this is really begins to kind of form within us at an early age. How we handle conflict sticks with us. And I know for me, growing up, I, I found myself handling conflict a few times uh, through actual violence. And uh, not because I was a fighter. Um, a lot of, I think a lot of people think when guys fight, like they're trying to be tough. Uh, I think that they're afraid. I know that was the case for me. I fought because I was afraid of what would happen if I didn't, what would be said about me, what would happen to me physically if I didn't. But I can tell you, I remember the day when I decided I was done handling conflict with violence. I got into a fight with this fella, and he was, uh, he was quite a bit bigger than I was. That's not when I decided. Um, but we get to, to tussling, and he grabs me and throws me into a van. Now, even then, not when I decided I was done with violence, because I hit 
this van and I landed like a cat, all right? Like Black Panther. I hit the ground <laughs> square. And I, in one, I've never hit somebody faster or harder in my life. I landed and then boom. I'm gonna be honest with you guys. I thought I killed him, right? I, I thought when I would look over, he would be out cold. But to my surprise, he did not fall. He did not stumble. The only thing that moved was his neck. He did one of these. <laughs> and then I realized I was fighting a Terminator from the future. <laughs> I just spent the rest of the time running in a circle, like trying to hopefully somebody would break this thing up before, before he killed me. That's when I decided I'm done, I'm done with violence. But what I didn't realize that even though I was done with that, I, I never really developed tools to handle conflict. It wasn't until I got married that I realized I really had no tools to handle conflict. And I often gravitated towards silence. I didn't have the language. Looking back, I could see how I would often withdraw or I would downplay the times when I would hurt her or offend her because I didn't know how to have the conversation. What is it for you? When conflict comes, which, which side do you kind of default to? Maybe more silence, maybe more violence. What we're gonna do is we're actually gonna pick up with a conflict that's happening in the church at this time when Paul's writing the letter, and he's gonna address that very conflict. And that's no surprise, right? Like, I'm sure you're walking through some conflict right now. The Bible's filled with it, our lives are filled with it, and we need to address it, because just like everything else, God has a plan for how we can handle it, in a healthy way. So if you have a Bible, go ahead and flip to Philippians chapter four. And we're gonna start in verse two today. This is what Paul says. He says, now I appeal to you, Euodia, and um, whew, man, I practice so hard on this. <laughs> Senshi, please, because you belong to the Lord, settle your disagreement. And I ask you, my true partner, to help these two women, for they worked hard with me in telling others the good news. They worked along with Clement and the rest of my coworkers. I want you to think about this. A lot of times in, in this context, when they would get a letter from someone like Paul, they would bring the whole church together and they would read this aloud with everyone in the room. Imagine. This letter's being written, these two women know what's going on between the two of them, but they don't know that everyone else knows maybe, or they don't think that definitely Paul knows from all the way over there, and then they get to this part and they read their names. Wow. But I think that points out a really important thing here, is that conflict is a big deal. It's such a big deal that Paul specifically calls it out between these two Women, and I'll put this out there, hypothetically, I don't know this for sure, but I'm just gonna put it out there. You might be here today, a part of this church, because of a conflict you had at the last church. Go a step further, you may be thinking about leaving this church because of a conflict that you are currently having. And I don't wanna say that there's never a reason to leave a church. But what I want us to see from this, this small account here, that there's a really big reason that we should try to stay and to settle our disagreements. That's what he does with these two. He says, hey, there's this, this conflict going on. And then you see what he said? I want you to settle, why? Because you belong to the Lord. Your life is no longer your own. Your purpose is no longer your own. And I actually have a big plan for your life, so I'm gonna need you to reconcile. I'm gonna need you to, to work this thing out. And I do wanna just take a moment and celebrate these two women. It says that these two women worked alongside Paul. That they did, they were there shoulder to shoulder bringing the gospel to the world. They are soldiers for the gospel. And, I, I, and it is Women's History Month, and I know that what was true of those women, that they were working hard for the gospel, is true of many women in our church today. So can we just take a moment and celebrate all the women in ministry, all the women leading in all the different environments around here? You. 
I don't have to say it out loud, but I will. This place would not be running without you, okay? So I want us to see that, that that conflict is a really big deal, and Paul spent the past few chapters trying to bring them to unity because of what's at stake. So when he hears about this, he says, we need to address this. So here's just the kind of umbrella that I wanna put over our talk today to, to kind of bring things in to what reality is, okay? And here it is. Conflict is common, reconciliation is required, right? Conflict is common, reconciliation is required. I think a lot of times, maybe especially in the church, when we experience a little bit of conflict, we think, oh, this must not be the space for me. I need to go find somewhere where I won't experience conflict. I don't know that place. Because once you get there, there's gonna be some some conflict. I mean, it reminds me of like when I sit down sometimes with a couple that just got married, honeymoon phase is over, and they're like, hey, we need to sit down. I'm like, okay, I sit down and start talking. They're like, yeah, we're, we're fighting, like a lot. I'm like, yeah, do you know why? Because you're the worst. <laughs> and you've had your whole life to hide parts of yourself. Now, this person doesn't get the first date version of you. They get the real version, the sweatpants version of you, the no makeup version of you, that T-shirt you wear that has the paint on it that they have to look at over and over. They get that version of you. So yeah, some conflict's gonna come, but conflict doesn't mean that we need to leave. Conflict is a cue which tells me this relationship needs to be repaired. And because of Jesus, Reconciliation is always possible. And so the way we're gonna look at this today is a little bit differently. We're not just gonna work through a chunk of scripture, but we're really gonna do some character studies. Because of what's going on in the Philippian church, Paul says that he's gonna, he's hoping to send two people. And we're just gonna read the account of these people that he's sending and kind of see, okay, what is it about them that if we applied to our lives, it would help bring joy into our relationships? Because, it, and it's so much more about who we are than necessarily what we do. Like if you were here last week, Pastor Aaron was talking about how a lot of times character is revealed during crisis. I would say the same thing is true about conflict. Character is revealed during conflict. So who do we want to be before we ever find ourselves in a conflict? Well, let's see what we can find. Uh, the first kind of character study we're gonna do is of Timothy. And Paul talks about Timothy, this is in chapter two, verse 19. Look at what he says. He says, if the Lord Jesus is willing, I hope to send Timothy to you soon for a visit. Then he can cheer me up by telling me how you are getting along. I have no one else like Timothy who genuinely cares about your welfare. All the others care only for themselves and not for what matters to Jesus Christ. But you know how Timothy has proved himself. Like a son with his father, he has served me in preaching the good news. So in just a few verses here, we can see why he's sending Timothy. Why in the midst of some conflict, why he would send someone like Timothy. And I think the big thing that we see that's that's different about Timothy is that he's humble. He has a humility about him. And I think what Paul's doing here is he's actually using you know, Timothy as a real life example of what humility looks like, which he taught from at the beginning of chapter two, if you remember this, but, but take a look just in case you have, you, you know, it's been a few weeks. He says, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Here it is. Be humble. Thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interest, but take an interest in others too. And I want you to think about that. Think about the conflicts in your life, both the ones that are going on now and in the past, and how many of them came, if you're being honest, because you were a little bit selfish, because you cared a little bit more about your interest than of the interest of the person on the other side of you. And Paul knows that That's human life, and that's really what's going on in this church. So he says, I'm gonna send Timothy. And the unique thing about Timothy, he gives two things about Timothy that are different from pretty much everyone else that he interacts with. He says first that he genuinely cares about the welfare of others. 
Who do we wanna be? We wanna be the type of people that generally care about the welfare. I love that word. It reminds me of the, the message God gives Jeremiah when he's looking out and they've, they're being exiled and he says, hey, look, you're going into this city and I want you to know your welfare is tied up in their welfare, so live accordingly. You won't prosper unless they prosper. It reminds me of the words of Jesus with this body, this church that he's putting together. He says, no, you're no longer just your own. You've actually been brought in on something, this body, where she's a hand and he's a foot and you're a finger and they're a toe and this is all working together. Your welfare is, is built on theirs. So you, you gotta place their wants and their desires over yours. You gotta treat it like it, you can't just treat them one way and expect that you can live another. And he says, Timothy gets this. Timothy understands, he cares about people. And then look at the second thing. He cares about what matters to Jesus. What a lens to think through life with. Think into those conflicts that you've went through, that you're going through now, and what if you place that filter over it? What matters to Jesus in this moment? Does it matter that I'm right? Does it matter that I proved them wrong? No. Once again, what Jesus is trying to do is bring us all together. He died so that we could not only be reconciled with him, but with one another, that we could have this unique spiritual family that nothing should be able to break. So here it is. God would rather you be reconciled than right. If you're wondering what matters to Jesus in the midst of this conflict, it is not that you are right. I know you're sitting there going, but you don't understand. I'm right. I didn't do anything wrong. I understand. But you can be right and still be wrong. You know what I mean? So this is this call for me and you to walk humbly, to deal with the selfish ambition that's in our heart, to lay that down, to die to ourselves, and to say, what is it gonna take for me to be reconciled to the person on the other side of me? That's what we see from Timothy. It is all about humility. The, the second one that we're gonna look at is another character study of Epaphroditus. Can we just take a moment? I mean, I can imagine one name, you know, but all three, can I get like a Chris or a Paul or a John, a Stephanie, something, Epaphroditus, um, beautiful name. <laughs> but take a look at this. Verse 25, chapter two. He says, meanwhile, I thought I should also send you Epaphroditus. I'm gonna send him back to you. He's from there. He's a true brother, coworker, fellow soldier, and he was your messenger to help me in my need. Wow. And then just skip down to verse 29. Look at, look at Paul's call to them. He says, welcome him with Christian love and with great joy and give him the honor that people like him deserve. For he risked his life for the work of Christ and he was at the point of death while doing for me what you couldn't do from far away. So here it is. If we look at the first one as Timothy was telling us all about what does it look like to be humble as we go into conflict? Because I think you guys can agree that a lot of conflict comes from a lack of humility. And I think what Epaphroditus is showing us is that a lot of conflict comes from a lack of honor. A lack of honor. Where we don't give people the honor that they deserve. Where we dishonor those, or we felt dishonored in the moment, and a lot of conflict comes out from that. And Paul gives us just an example of what does it look like to honor somebody. Did you catch that? He talks all about this. He, Epaphroditus, he says, no, no, you guys, I know he's from there, but this guy is a soldier. This guy risked, risked his life for the gospel. He stood shoulder to shoulder with me through it all. So when he comes, meet him with the love of God and give him the honor that people like him deserve. Honor. I love honor. I, I come from a very honoring, loyal type of a background from my family growing up. And then also, this church is one of my favorite things about Trader's Point. It's the way that we honor one another. It's the way that we show respect for one another. It's the way we value one another. 
And anytime I talk about honor, I cannot talk about honor without thinking about the movie Men of Honor. Anybody in here seen the movie Men of Honor, Cuban Goody Jr.? Three of you, great. Um, <laughs> let's go back about 20 years, great movie. It's um, about the first African American uh, to become a master diver in the Navy and his story of going through it. But he's at the end and he's trying to be reinstated into the Navy and he gives this incredible speech of how important honor is. And just in case, obviously you didn't watch it, so I'm gonna read it for you, of the speech that he gives. He says, we have many traditions in my career. I've encountered most of them. Some are good, some not so good. I would, however, not be here today were it not for our greatest tradition of all, Captain Hanks. And if I was ever gonna settle another conflict with violence, it would have been with Captain Hanks. And he says, and which one is that, Chief Brashear? Here it is, honor, sir. And if, when you watch this for the first time, you'll be crying at this moment. But it's just this power of honor. And, and it's, it brings so much beauty and it strengthens relationships when we show honor to one another. And it's here at Trader's Point, but it's not a Trader's Point thing, it's a biblical thing. In Romans 12, 10, look, look at what it says. Paul says, love one another with brotherly affection, outdoing one another and showing honor. The idea here is that me and you should be competing. It's one of the only times in scripture that it encourages us to compete with one another, and it's to compete in showing honor. And maybe you're asking the question, how do I honor people? What does that even look like? And I just wanna give you three ways, because I guarantee there is someone in your life that you need to honor, myself included. So three ways that you can honor someone this week. Celebrate them. Celebrate them. Celebrate what God is doing in their life. Highlight what you see, just like what Paul did with Epaphroditus. The second one is value them. Value them and let them know that you are valuing them. Rearrange some things to show how important they are to you. Value their time this week. That's how you honor them. And then show respect. Show respect for who they are. Show respect for who they are to you. And, and here's the thing, show them and give them the honor that they deserve for people like that, what they deserve. Because here's the thing, everyone you come into contact with is someone that God created and Jesus died for. They are worthy of your honor. <laughs> if Jesus decided they're worth dying for, then me and you shouldn't have a problem deciding that they're worthy of giving honor to, right? Amen? Amen. So that goes us back to, just, to, just to push it in even harder. So who do I, who should I honor? I love this saying that we have around here. It's actually a, a, it's a cultural value of our staff. When we talk about honor, we say we honor up, we honor down, we all are all around, right? We honor up, we honor down, we honor all around. Honor gets real wonky, and I think this is why a lot of people push back from honor, when honor only flows up, when honor is only given to the person that's above me, when honor is only for my boss, honor for the king or the queen. No, no, no. Biblical honor goes up, it goes down, it goes all around. So for you at your job, honor for sure for your supervisor, but honor for the people that you're leading as well. Honor for those that you share an office space with. We honor up, we honor down, we honor all around. So those are the first two. Paul says, hey, when it comes to the conflict, if we can be people of humility and be people of honor, man, that's gonna make so much of a difference when it comes to the conflict in the church. And the last kind of case study, character study that I want us to look at is actually one of Paul himself. Paul himself goes through this beautiful change of who he once was into how, who he is now, and it'll make all the difference as we continue to work through conflict. So this one is in uh, chapter three, verse five. Paul says, and kicks off with it, I was circumcised when I was eight days old. Anybody got a friend that just shares information that's like, <laughs> thank you? Um, 
He has a point, but it's, it's just a lot to take in. <sighs> I am a pure-blooded citizen of Israel and a member of the tribe of Benjamin, a real Hebrew if there was ever one. I was a member of the Pharisees who demand the strictest obedience to the Jewish law. I was so zealous that I harshly persecuted the church. And as for righteousness, I obeyed the law without fault. I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ for God's way of making us right with him, with himself, depends on faith. This is beautiful. So why Paul is sharing all of this is because the way he used to identify, he was a Hebrew. From the birth, from his bloodline to what happened to him when he was eight days old, to the education that he got, to the status that he had within his culture, that is how he was known. And that was the most valuable thing to him. And because that was the most valuable thing, for a season, it even blinded him from God. That he even started to persecute the church, that he was there when some of the first ones were being executed. He was blinded because he was deeming these things that were so valuable to him but in the grand scheme of things, we're actually worthless. And that's what he says. He says, hey, you can check my resume. I, was, I had more respect than anyone else. But he says, now I count it as garbage. And that's a real churched up translation that they gave. Even another churched up translation, but closer to what he says here is, it, I count it as poop. I count it as extra, it is, it is nothing, not that those weren't good things and amazing things and he achieved so much, but he said, in comparison to Jesus, in comparison to the life God has for me, in comparison to what Jesus has done for me and now the relationship I have with him, I count it as garbage, as rubbish, as nothing. So I just wanna ask you today, here's the question, what am I considering valuable that is worthless to Jesus. It may be the thing you grew up with, it may be the thing that has brought you identity, it may be the thing that creates so much conflict in your life though because you're constantly trying to protect it or to prove yourself. You're trying to make yourself right before God and before other people. That's one of the dangers of religion, that it makes you pretend. It makes you believe that you have to be right to be made right, that it is all on you. But here's the beauty of the gospel, what it allows you to step into. You no longer have to pretend. You no longer have to just break yourself down and kill yourself to be made right. You've already been made right by the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And here's what we have on the other side of the cross. We are able to embrace brokenness. So many fights come because I'm trying to protect something that I've deemed valuable, that I'm afraid of losing. But because of the cross, I'm able to embrace my brokenness. I don't have to pretend because it's not on me. And I'm telling you, when we get into a conflict and we don't have anything to prove and nobody to prove it to, That's when people stop being the problem. People cease being the problem when we cease feeling like we have to be the hero. But we get to come into this place and we get to meet people right where they are. And we get to move into this kind of shared pool of meaning where I want to be reconciled with you. And I can put up my hands and I can embrace my weakness and I can say I messed up and I can say I hurt you and I can say I offended you. And I'm not overwhelmed with guilt or shame because in my weakness, I am made strong. That's what we have because of Jesus. And I know a lot of y'all are tracking with me, but this is kind of big, it's kind of 
out there, theoretical, of being humble, of honoring. Some of you are like, okay, but, you know, Janet's going to be at my cubicle 9 a.m. tomorrow. <laughs> what do you got for me that I can give to her, right? And I do. I, I do want us to close today just with some practical handles. Because here's the thing. The best kind of conflict is the one that never had to happen because we lived humbly and we honored everyone around us. The second best type of conflict is one that is done in a God-honoring way, in a healthy way. And one of the best ways that you can get a feel for this, and it's just kind of a marker of health, other organizations use it whenever there's a conflict, and you can use it personally as well. It's when something happens, when a conflict started, when someone was offended, what's the time between the offense and the action that was taken? And for me and you, as followers of Jesus, here's something that should be true of us as we continue to follow him. The longer and deeper your walk with Jesus, the shorter the time between mistake and repentance. Once again, because of the gospel, I embrace my brokenness. I got nothing to hide, nothing to prove, and nobody to prove it to. So when that moment comes, I don't shift to silence. And I'm also not too aggressive and hot-headed, but I come in humbly and honoring, and I address it head on, all right? And then now I just wanna give us five steps to reconcile conflict in your life. No matter if it's between a marriage, some friends, people at school, at the job, whatever it is, here's five steps to resolve conflict, all right? Here's the first one, and they all begin with a D because everything's easier if it begins with the same letter. Um, first one, define the problem. And just a pro tip, if you sit down, you're having this conversation, and you're defining the problem, don't say that the other person is the problem, <laughs> even if they are the problem. But I'm sitting down with them, I'm defining the problem, and hopefully, I'm coming in humbly, hopefully I'm coming in. I've, I have a history of honoring them, of celebrating them, of valuing them. If I have a history of that, it makes it so much easier to bring in a problem to the relationship. The second thing is describe what's not working. There's something that's going on, maybe it's a pattern, Maybe it was just a big moment that it kind of hurt me, and I'm worried that if this continues, it's going to separate our relationship. So I'm going to define the problem, and then I'm going to describe what's not working. What's not working in this situation? And I want to make sure that we're solving the same problem, and we're looking at the same things that are not working. And then here's the, the third thing, discover. Discover new possibilities Together, once again, this is not the design to say, hey, here's what you need to go do. Because if we go back to one, you're the problem. No, so we talk about new possibilities together. And that gets us to the next one. Detail how each person contributes to the solution. Hey, this is what's been going on. This is the problem. We've talked about it. We've brainstormed some things. Here's what I'm gonna do to make this relationship better, to bring reconciliation. Here's what you're going to do and then we're gonna actually do what we said we were gonna do. And then we're gonna come back and debrief. Maybe it's in a week, maybe it's in a month, but we're gonna get back together and say, hey, how is it going? Was that really the problem? Is it getting better? So yeah, I would just encourage you, take a screenshot of this right now. These five steps, and just try them this week. Um, chances are you have a conflict in your life. Just sit down with someone on the other side and begin to work through this together. What could happen if we could have that kind of reconciliation? Man, I could tell you it would bring a lot more health to the church and it would bring a lot more people to the church. It would bring a lot more people to Jesus. If me and you could do our parts of bringing reconciliation to others. And I want us to, I want us to end with hope though because I know it can be heavy and I know you can be thinking about the conflict that you have and maybe you're thinking it's, it's impossible. I don't know if reconciliation is required. And I'm feeling anything but joy right now. I just want us to go right to the next verse. After Paul calls out the conflict that's going on in the church, and it's a big one. It's so big that he feels he needs to address it. And he's calling the whole church to come around them to figure it out. But look at his next words. Even in the midst of the conflict, he says, always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice 
Let everyone see that you are considerate in all you do. Remember the Lord is coming soon. So he says, hey, I know that, th- I know that this is getting everybody's attention. I know you're a little worried how it's gonna go. He says, hey, I want you to have joy. I want you to have joy because it's it, not that this conflict, not because it's not a big deal, but in, once again, in comparison, if we can just take a step back and remember the joy, if we can remember that Jesus was able to reconcile us to God, then there's hope in this situation. And that if Jesus is who he said he is, then even though I messed up and even though I hurt this other person, I don't have to live with the shame or the guilt or the fear. I can embrace my brokenness and step forward and that there is hope in this relationship. He says, and then he says, because the Lord is coming soon. He places some urgency on it. And I don't know if, unfortunately, you've ever been in that situation where you thought, man, I just, I thought I would have more time. I thought we would be able to work this out. I thought that it would get better one day, but then it just got further and further away from me. So he places this urgency on it. And he says, no, 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 have joy. Go in humility, go in an honoring way, but, but handle it right now. And that's only possible because of Jesus. And I just wanna put this out here. It's the same place we started. It's how we're gonna end. But I'm gonna take a, a different approach to it. And it's conflict is common and reconciliation is required. Conflict is common, reconciliation is required when it comes to having a relationship with God. Maybe you've been coming in for a little bit. Maybe you have these different ideas of what religion is and what it's not. Can I just say that there's this There's only one way to get to God. And I know you're probably experiencing that conflict. You're wrestling with God. You're trying to make sense of it all. The only way is to come to him and to trust that the finished work of Jesus is enough. And now it is by faith that we are reconciled to God. Because Jesus, the son of God, lived this perfect life for me and you. He went to a cross that on that cross, he defeated sin and death, paying the penalty, making us right with God. Reconciliation is only possible because of Jesus, and that is a relationship that you can step into and begin today. And for all of us, I really want us to drill in on why reconciliation is required, because it's bigger than us. Because not only did Jesus save us from something, he saved us for something. He has a very specific mission and purpose for your life. Take a look at it in 2 Corinthians. It says, and God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. How can we reconcile people to God that we're not reconciled with? For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us when we speak for Christ, when we plead, come back to God. For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin, so that we could be made right with God through Christ. Reconciliation is required and it's possible. And what I've been loving over the past few weeks, what Pastor Aaron's been doing is just creating a space to respond here in the moment. Because as you know, once you leave those doors, the next thought is, what's for lunch? And what do I need to get done today so that I can be ready for tomorrow? So we just wanna create another one of those spaces today. And this may be the most important thing that happens throughout your time where no one's up here speaking, no one's up here singing. This is just a moment between you and God to wrestle, to hold up a mirror and to say, how am I doing with humility? God, where can you grow me? How am I doing with honor? Who do I need to honor? How can I embrace brokenness? What is the conflict in my life? And just watch how God begins to bring things to the surface. Maybe for you, this is the moment where you come back to God for the first time. And I just wanna stand here as his representative, calling you back to him. This is a place where that can happen in the next few minutes. Take advantage of that. So I'm just gonna pray over us, and then the next few minutes are yours for you to do a work between you 
and God. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you so much for today. God, we thank you for the joy that is possible because of your gospel. God, we thank you for the freedom that it brings when we no longer have to prove or protect or defend ourselves. But God, you allow us to embrace our brokenness and to come to you and to be made strong by you. So God, I just pray right now that this would be a moment where your spirit searches out humility, where your spirit searches out honor, where your spirit brings brokenness to the surface. God, will you bring real people to the hearts and minds of everyone in this room and everyone watching? And that God, this would be a day and a week and a season of reconciliation. A day where relationships that we had already walked away from, God, could be reconciled in the name of Jesus. And God, I pray that today is a day that for the first time, people experience a reconciled relationship between you and them. Father, we give you this space. We give your spirit the room needed to shake some things up, break down some walls, and to bring us into the life that you have for us. Father, it's in your perfect name we pray. Amen.